Hi, morning everybody. Um, this is nerve wracking, so you know, bear with me. Um, I want to tell you a story. When I was 10 years old, I was in the school playground with my friends, and I said to them out of the blue, one day you're going to see my face on TV, and you're going to see my name in the newspapers and in the magazines. And I had no idea how that was going to happen. I just knew that I was going to do something memorable in my life, and people would pay attention to it. Fast forward a few years later, when I was 23 in August 2009, and I was sitting on the couch of the Today Show in the Rockefeller Center in New York, and Anne Curry was about to interview me. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my life and my experiences that led to this different kind of fame. We've already heard that sometimes things don't work out exactly how you planned, but I spoke my dream at the time into existence. I was born in Trinidad to parents of mixed descent, Trinidadian parents. But at the age of three, because of my father's job in the United Nations, my family moved to Israel in the Middle East. And then we moved to Syria a short while after. And if you know anything about the Middle East, you know it's an area that has a lot of tension and unrest. And we were actually there at the end of the Gulf War. So it was a very difficult time for two to have two young children for my mother and father to get a proper education for their children and feel safe. So the decision was made for my mother, brother, and I to move to Cyprus, which is a Greek island in the middle of the Mediterranean. And it was not only safe, and it was a good place for us to be educated and grow up. It was also easily accessible for my dad to get to whenever he had time off. Living without my dad, seeing him two, maybe three times a year if we were lucky, was very difficult because I'm very, very close to him. And shortly after arriving in Cyprus, a white spot appeared on my naturally dark skin. And this white spot grew, and other white spots appeared. And I was diagnosed at the age of five. I was diagnosed with a condition known as vitiligo. And that's what I looked at at the age of seven. Um, vitiligo, many people know it as what Michael Jackson had. Um, a lot of people don't believe it's a real condition. It actually is. So. At the age of seven, as you can see, and throughout my preteen years, vitiligo took over my arms and legs until at the age of 17, I was completely and naturally depigmented. As you can probably imagine, being a young child and being a teenager with patches all over your skin, it's a little difficult with your peers and in the world in general. It's, it can be hurtful, it can be, there's been teasing, there's been taunting, I was bullied. I was called really horrible names like Spot and Dalmatian. Even these days, I'm called things like albino and vampire. Um, and people you know and people you don't even know make hurtful remarks. Um, there have been rumors that if you sleep in the same room as me, you'll catch my disease and die. I've had strangers walk up to me in the street and rub my skin to see if it would rub off or if it was real. People thought it was makeup. Um, and it's, it's people doing things without asking you if it's okay as well. It's a little disrespectful of your personal space and stuff. So I wasn't exactly one of the beautiful ones, let's say. I don't know if anybody here, I'm sure a lot of people in the world feel like sometimes your looks dictate the opportunities that you will have in your life, um, which is very sad because society bases a lot on how we look, places a lot of importance on beauty. And sometimes if you're not one of those beautiful people, you feel like, your world is limited or that you're pushed into the shadows and you shouldn't be able to do certain things. Um, I was very lucky. Well, this is me as a teenager. And I was also wearing braces and glasses, so I wasn't having the best teenage years in my life. Um, I was very lucky. I had a very supportive group of friends. I was actually part of the popular crowd, but I think mostly because I was smart and I used to help them with their homework. But, you know, it worked out for me. And the most supportive people in my life were my mom and dad. And my mom and dad, their strategy was to not let me fade into the background and let everybody else tell me that I couldn't do things. So their way of getting me out there to talk to people and not be shy and be very social was to send me to as many extracurricular activities as possible. So sports, music, you name it, I did it. I don't know when I slept, um, but it helped. Now that I'm older, I can see how much it helped. And one of, the, one of the activities they sent me to that really I fell in love with was dance. I really love to dance. I did it since I was five years old until I was 20. At the age of 17, I suffered an injury which stopped me from being able to 
go ahead and study dance professionally. I got a back injury during a volleyball match. So I lost a lot of the ability that would have led me to dance professionally. Instead, I decided that I was going to spend every day after school, after studying for five A-levels, after volleyball practice, after netball practice, after band practice, four hours a day in the dance studio, teaching all the other classes and learning all the material, so that at 18 years old, I was the youngest in Cyprus and the first in my dance school to become a dance teacher with honors. So this is me with my friends as teenagers. And not being one of the most beautiful people, and you see them dating, and you see people interested in them, you kind of develop the mindset, well, if I can't be the most beautiful, I'm going to be the most talented, or I'm going to be the smartest, or I'm going to be the funniest. And you get this kind of overachiever mentality, which in the story I described before, that's how I was. I was a real overachiever. And I, I started messing around as well with my clothes and, and, and masking my condition. And I used to wear hats. I was the first in my group of friends to like do all these stylish things. And before I knew it, fashion was a part of me before I realized I actually wanted to be a part of fashion. Um, so this was my way of being popular as I was the most stylish one. You can't really see there, but it happened. You know? <laughs> and I went on to study fashion. And while I was in London, well, this is my first runway collection, which I went back the year after and won the Next Generation Designer Award at Fashion Week. And while I was studying in London, um, a journalist contacted me to interview me about my skin for a health column. And this was before Michael Jackson passed away. So it was really only going to be a small piece, whoever reads that stuff in somewhere in the back of the newspaper. And suddenly he did pass away by the time the interview went to print. And this thing that I had lived with for all my life that was such a part of me by this point that my friends and family, myself, we didn't even acknowledge it anymore. And now it was worldwide news. And it really forced me to take a look at the life that I had had up until that point. And that is when a new set of dreams um, started forming for me. Because after that interview, on the Today Show, then I did the Inside Edition. I did This Morning in the UK. I had some radio and TV interviews here in Trinidad as well. Um, I got so many emails and messages and hundreds and hundreds of people from around the world suddenly seeing me as a voice for them because they had either the same thing as me or another skin disease or they looked different, they had been bullied. And all of a sudden, they felt confident because I had come out and spoken about my skin disease. And I didn't realize like, it wasn't about me anymore. It was now about how I could do something to help people with this little opportunity that I had. So being a fashion designer, I obviously have dreams. And I want my fashion business to grow as bigger than anything that's here in Trinidad, bigger than anything that's in the Caribbean. I want my name to be alongside some of the greatest in the world. But my spotlight in fashion helps me to have a voice when it comes to raising awareness for skin disease. And that actually gave me the opportunity to start um, in 2010 when I returned to Trinidad. I did the first walk for skin around the savannah. And I just asked a few friends to walk with me and over 100 people showed up and walked around the savannah for skin disease, which was great. Um, and also, ha having this work that I do now, raising awareness for skin disease, helps my fashion work because I have a dream that one day, people like me who need to be safe in the sun, who don't have pigment, I burn very easily. I get water blisters from head to toe if I don't wear SPF 100 in the sun. Um, things like that. I would like to start a skincare and cosmetics line for people who want to be fashionable, be beautiful, but still be safe. So I'm telling you this dream now, so hopefully like when I was 10, it's going to happen, <laughs> right? Um, and this, if not other people messaging me, is my biggest motivation. I am now a mother. And if there's any reason to ever make your dreams come true, it's when you realize that your legacy must continue when you're gone. And um, I need to leave, for me, I need to leave something behind for her to be proud of, to benefit from, and also to be part of. So your dreams really have the ability to influence other people. And that's what I've realized on my journey. So when now leaving you, this is my advice. Let everything you do be a step towards achieving your dreams. Even if you stumble or slow down, don't stop. I read a quote by um, Martin Luther King Jr. this week, and it said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, just keep moving. And that's true. And we were already told today that sometimes it doesn't go exactly as you planned. I didn't think I would be sitting on TV talking about my skin. I thought I would be doing something a little more glamorous. 
Um, learn as much as you can, meet as many people as you can. The skills that you learn, even if you think it has nothing to do with what you want to do, somehow it always ends up helping. And the people that you meet, treat all of them with respect, because you never know which one of them is going to be the next stepping stone in achieving your dreams for the future. And last and most importantly, your dream belongs to you and no one else. Don't ever let anyone take that away from you. Um, traveling the world, I've learned there's a lot of people who don't know how to dream. Those are the ones that tell you you can't do it. There's a lot of people who don't have a dream. There's a lot of people who've never been encouraged to dream. If you have a dream, that's amazing. If you actually follow your dream, that's incredible. But more importantly, if you have a dream that has the ability to positively change somebody else's life, that is the most rewarding thing you will ever experience. Thank you.